so I'm here to present uh, some results that was mainly made by my colleagues. That one is on parental leave and one is away on vacation and one was busy this weekend. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so I will stand here and try to present their work, or I was part of it as well. So it, I think it should be fine. But if <coughs> you have really detailed question, I might to uh, forward them to to them. Uh, and I'm Henrik Eriksson. I'm a PhD working at SP, Swedish Technical Research Institute, and. Uh, I've been working with uh, dependable computer systems and testing of active safety systems for 12 years now. So, what is the motivation behind our work? Uh, as you, most of you will go to Asta Zero on uh, Wednesday, and we ha we have a need for low-cost RTK. Uh, GPS positioning solutions on the proving ground. Uh, you might know that those nice uh, RTK uh, systems that are available today, they cost like 30 kilo euros per piece. And that's really expensive if you want to put them in many objects on the proving ground, which we would, would like in the near future when we will start to test uh, cooperative ITS systems and autonomous systems. And just we can't invest in such uh, vast amount of uh, uh, high-end RTK solution. And when you are when you are on a proving ground, the, <laughs> the, the equipment needs to be expendable. Unfortunately, sooner or later you will run over something that shouldn't be run over, and then you don't want to break things for 30 kilo euros as well. So, we, we the the aim of this project from the beginning was to look at what can we do with those low-cost GPS RTK receivers that are starting to emerge on the market. Uh, and also, in the long run, we are, as you, you uh, asked the question on, isn't, just, isn't it just to put an uh, RTK base station in, in, in every corner? I, I don't think it's that easy, unfortunately. But if they are cheap, you can put them in more places, of course. And, and you could, of course, if you are not interested in uh, an absolute perfect uh, positioning, but a relative uh, positioning, you can have one uh, of the, for example, two vehicles act as a moving base station, and then the one in the future, uh, in the forward, is a rover, and then they have a very good relative positioning, but you don't know as well where in the world you are. But that could in increase the field of view of the of the vehicles as well. So these ones were bought from the beginning in the project. There is, uh, you see, they are fairly cheap. It's the most expensive one is five hundred dollars per piece. You get, you have to buy two of them, and then you get the uh, radio link to communicate the correction data as well. Uh, they have a fairly good update rate. Mo all of these are. Uh, only using one of the two GPS frequencies, so they are L1, if you are familiar wi with that. Uh, and what is important with this, if, if you have your, like your mobile phone, it has a GPS receiver, and it's using the code from the, like the bits, ones and zeros from the satellites to determine your position. But these ones, they look at the face of the radio wave instead. So this uh, receivers output raw, s raw data, that's, uh, that's why that's called raw, so you don't do the solution inside and, and look at the code. Uh, but this is sort of mambo-jambo until you put it into some software that translates it to LUTs and LONGs. And then we have used, it was fun to hear about the GNU radio before, this is also an open source library for doing RTK processing. Some Japanese guy has made it. So we run the RTK software on a, in Linux on a single board computer, a Raspberry Pi. So it, you don't need that much processing power. So that's $50, no, $40 more you need. And uh, this one is uh, uh, one of those Kickstarter projects, actually. In, 
think it's a California based company that was established after this Kickstarter. Um, unfortunately, they work good together when one of the their receivers uh, work as the base and one as the rover, but it has problems receiving standardized RTK data. Therefore, we couldn't use it in our comparison with others because we wanted to use a standard base station so we could share the same correction data for all of them. So we had to skip that one, unfortunately. But it seems to work fairly well when you used it with themselves, so to speak. Uh, so I'm not from the measurement department at, uh, at SP, but we have uh, the geodetic guys that have those fancy antennas that uh, suppresses um, multipath. And we had a nice splitter so we can take the same antenna signals to all receivers that we evaluated. So we received, uh, so Asta Zero has their own RTK base station. And then you have a radio modem and you feed the correction data to all three. So this is the expensive one and these are the two cheap ones. And we had uh, this antenna and this is for the static setup. And I can show you, no, it will come later. But we put it on uh, one of the rooftops in the city area of Asta Zero Proving Ground. So it's fairly open. So you get a good field of view of the satellites. Uh, in the dynamic test, we used a driving robot as well, so we could get predefined uh, trajectories. Uh, and then here's our test vehicle, driving robot for Anthony Best Dynamics, which usually used this Oxford system, so it was easy to interface. So we put all our measurement equipment in the in the rear, and in this case, we changed and used. Uh, the vehicle antenna that they normally use at Asta Zero, we don't want put this large one on top of the vehicle. Um, there is some analysis framework. All of these are different kinds of open source programs, except for those related to the Oxford system that we got to use at Asta Zero to get uh, just a comma separated vector. So this is happening when you measure and then you can do some post-processing afterwards. So you maybe are, this is the typical format for correction data, RTCM3. You have the raw, and then you can also get the uh, NMEA. That's the typical navigation where you get lat, long, heading, altitude, speed, and so on. Number of vis uh, satellites. Um, so here it was mounted on top of the one of the buildings it is in the city area. Oh, it doesn't look that good. Uh, it's very hard for you to see, I imagine, but there, there is some initial uh, problems, er, not problems, but it gets some time before you get a float solution. Uh, and eventually, when you see the green one here, then it's a fixed solution, so the inaccuracy uh, gets better. And the data here is, the I think it's the standard deviation. And it's in this case, it includes this initial part, which makes them these ones look worse than they are. And in this case, we don't have the, the data of the o reference system in, in this uh, picture, but it was roughly the same in this case. So there are two situations here. Those two are from the proving ground, and this is with another location where they used a shorter cable because it was 20 meters cable from the antenna at the roof down to the. So this was just. It seems like this. Um, what is it called? Suppression. Is that uh, dampening? Attenuation. Attenuation. Yes. In the in the cable might have been a, a, a factor here, but so in this case we got. Uh, sub meter in the standard deviation, which we are not that happy with, but it was okay. Uh, we had the dynamic test, and we were driving in eighth on the high speed area here. So we're making two times three turns, I think. And here we plot, I think, the blue one 
is the OXTS. Uh, the red one is the NS row and the green one is the U blocks. And you can see that they are fairly consistent, but there are some uh, offset all the time. And the offset is not, uh, it's not uh, continuous or w it's not uh, consequent. It's the offset could be a little, depending on the direction of the vehicle, the offset varies a little bit. So in some cases, and according to the GPS expert at SP, this could be that the guys in this uh, di did start this measurement and before they had fixed solution. They were not patient enough to went wait for the fix, so they had the float solution and then it's probably the receiver stayed, stayed like that. But uh, the performance seem, this is one meter here, so this in this case it's one meter often here, per perhaps 30 centimeters. So it's, it's fairly good still with those cheap ones. Uh, we play a little bit with this one. We have a, an uh, auto autopiloting RC car. So this is like 80 centimeters is one to six scale. Where we have, uh, I can move to the next one. Where we have a GPS antenna, one of these uh, raw receivers. We have the Raspberry Pi making the positioning. We receive uh, uh, Correction data from the ba base station via an interface card. We have a motor controller of the electric motors, which we can have use for odometry to do dead reckoning. Uh, yes, and th this interface card has also an, an IMU nine degrees of freedom, so you can get all the orientations and rotations and accelerations. Uh, and in, in this case, uh, we were driving in a circle. Uh, 23 laps, we had 40% of the time fixed solution and 58% time of float solution. And in this case, the, all the track was all the time bounded in an 11 centimeter corridor here. And actually, part of the problem here is actually the autopilot that isn't good enough to follow the circle. So, but here we have very good conditions because uh, we are driving this outside SP in one of the parking lot and it's 50 meters from the base station. So that is part of SWEPOS, the Swedish grid for correction data. But we are f f uh, fairly happy with these results actually in, in this case. So here it's close to decimeter precision, but we still need to evaluate this performance and it's uh, ongoing to fuse it with uh, the other sensors that are on board on this uh, uh, RC car. And what we would like to investigate further is of course uh, both, which I said, moving, have a moving base. So one of the, one, one we have several of these RC, RC cars. So one of them can act as a base and one as, as a uh, rover. And also we are thinking on uh, because when we show this to Volvo and other guys, they say, oh yeah, it's good uh, to have it in the proving ground and you need a base station and so on. But we wanted to do reference measurements basically everywhere with RTK. So how do we get uh, some base stations along the highways and so on? And, and there are a few ideas since to get really good precision, you should be in within 10 kilometers from a ba base station. That's Otherwise, they start to degrade quite severely. So you need to have a base station every tens kilometer. Uh, one idea that is not working the whole way, but that would be to use the base stations for cellular technologies. They are already out there, and you usually know their posi uh, position. They already have a GPS module inside. They just don't transmit data. And uh, to have all of those transmit base uh, correction data. That would be a step in the correct uh, direction, but they are still sparse, too sparse apart. Uh, but there are other solutions that I think it's called network RTK or something where you, uh, for example, if you have the all the correction stations grids in Sweden, you can say, I am here, can you by looking at all the uh, base stations around me, 
create a virtual base station. And then the virtual base station says this is how a base station would work here. Uh, however, the problem is when you travel like this and then you get similar handover uh, problems like you would have in a cellular network, which you have solved, of course. But when you get from one base station to another, you have to solve because you get new data and then you will lose your accurate position for a while. And you can't do that if you're driving autonomously. So you have to solve that in some way. And I, I don't know how to do it, but it might be doable. Uh, so, okay, the, the, the yellow ones here is how the GPS track would look for a conventional GPS without, it's the same data as the green one, but without the taking care of the corrections. So you can see the, you, you get much, much better positioning still in this case. Uh, so I would say that those low cost uh, GPS mod modules, they have promising performance. And we were surprised that they are so good that they are already now. Uh, and actually I saw, saw some low cost dual frequency RTK solution now. It's available as well. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's available. Uh, need some uh, further investigation, especially with regards to the dynamic performance. Uh, and I think it could be wad widespread in the transport system if you find a good way of uh, giving or distributing the RTK correction data. However, I think I won't solve your problem in the city areas still. There are other problems there with multipaths. You might need really expensive antennas and things like that. So I think we, we will need a mix of positioning techniques in the future depending on where you are. I think in a highway so situation where everything is nice, so to speak, I think RTK in the future could work. In city areas it will still be a challenge and we will need other techniques that we will have heard about here and so on. Uh, yeah, because uh, it's, it's fun because you say you can always position yourself with the camera to see where you are in the lanes. But I drive a car having those lane detector and it doesn't work all the time. Mm -hmm. it, it just it has but just to be a, a car. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> the, the track always works. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. No, but it's yeah. in, in Sweden we have winter time. That's challenging. It fails sometimes when it rains because it sees some water tracks instead of the lines. Snow. Uh, sn snow it's when it's too curvy, it can't follow the lines. Uh, and uh, if the it has to be s a certain quality of the lane markings as well. So, yeah, it's a challenge. I'm, I'm quite sure it will be a sensor fusion story at the end of this, and a quite advanced one as well. Right. And, and uh, of course, we should never forget that some application that will uh, be based on positioning technology will probably be safety related as well. So that's a real challenge. Okay. So let's cheers with an applause. <laughs>